Hello everyone, this is Dr. Sheely, and I wanted to introduce you to a poet author named uh, Dante. Uh, Dante is a great character to uh, look at to help us understand the Renaissance, plus images from his writing will appear in a lot of the artwork that we see while we're in Italy. Um, first let's talk a little bit about um, um, the time of uh, Dante. This is late 1200s, early 1300s. This is really right at the beginning or going into the Renaissance. Um, we, you may, from uh, TV shows, movies, uh, books, some fantasy books, have gotten the idea of Europe as, um, as this place where you have lords, nobles who live in castles and have their serfs who live around them. Uh, what you really see going into the Renaissance is a shift from uh, that hereditary agriculture-based aristocracy. Um, and uh, the development of what you might call a, a middle class, although many of these people became quite wealthy, but a merchant class, a development of commerce and banking, uh, trade guilds. Um, and uh, Dante was... Um, was of this class. Uh, his family were booksellers. Um, in Italy, while elsewhere in Europe at this time you're starting to have some uh, uh, national sensibility like in uh, France, um, in England, some other places, uh, Italy was still a group of uh, city-states who were all in um, independent. Uh, they had some sort of constitutional rule and were ruled by some sort of council. Not necessarily democratic, but at least wide voice in the uh, management of the city. And a great deal more civil liberty than had been um, available in the past. Now, even within this setting, you had a lot of conflicts. There was violence and wars between the cities, within faction, between factions within cities. At various times, you had different uh, cities um, uh, dominate each other and uh, fight with each other. Uh, one of the um, conflicts that really spread into Italy um, out of um, area around what would today be part of Germany is a conflict between the Ghibellines and the um, and the Guelphs. Uh, the Ghibellines were uh, more associated with the aristocracy. They were loyal to the Holy Roman Emperor. The Guelphs were more came out of the uh, merchant class, uh, enjoyed the constitutional rule, civil liberty, and were more loyal to the Pope. Um, now, in the midst of this, we have uh, we meet Dante Alighieri. Uh, he lived in Florence. Um, oops, lived in Florence to a, in a book selling family. He was a respe uh, respected Italian language poet, which was really unusual at the time because often literature, most literature was in Latin. And he became a political le leader and a military leader. Um, he was uh, one of the leaders in the battle that uh, ultimately, where the Guelphs ultimately triumphed over the Ghibellines for the, um, for the um, uh, rule of Florence. Now, an interesting thing about um, Adante, remember he's a poet, Dante, when he was nine, he fell in love with a girl named Beatrice, who was a year younger than him. And uh, although they were never close in their during their lives, um, he continued to basically worship her from from afar. Uh, around uh, when she was around twenty, she married and then died a couple of years later. Dante wrote a widely acclaimed book of poetry and prose that was dedicated to her at this time. And uh, for him, she became an image of God's grace in uh, his work called the Divine Comedy, of which you probably know of the first volume of that, The Inferno. Dante eventually marries uh, and has four kids. 
Now, unfortunately, uh, while the Guelphs uh, ruled in Florence and they had their constitutional rule by their council, a lot of people involved, there arose trouble in Florence. Um, a family feud in another town led the, to a Guelf split and some violent turmoil and uh, into two parties. You had the Black Guelphs who um, um, appealed to the Pope. Remember, Guelphs are as loyal to the Pope. They appealed to the Pope to send the French King's brother Charles and his army uh, to try to resolve this dispute uh, so, um, in their favor. The White Guelphs, who uh, Dante was part of, uh, wanted to appeal to, po to the Pope to protect their li liberty and not to use this uh, French um, and Charles. So, uh, Dante goes with a delegation from Florence, from the Whites, to, um, to Rome uh, to appeal to the Pope. Meanwhile, Charles arrives in Florence, and in the midst of all of this, uh, the Pope sides with the blacks, uh, which uh, Boniface became for uh, Dante the symbol of everything that was wrong with the church at the time. Uh, the delegation uh, from the whites to the Pope, uh, the rest of them essentially abandoned Dante, and went back to Florence and blamed Dante for the whole trouble in the first place. Uh, so Dante was exiled uh, from Florence which was a very common punishment at the time. Uh, when you were on the losing end of a battle, you and often your family was exiled and often your property was confiscated or even destroyed. We'll run it, go, we'll come across a little piazza in Florence that's really weird because it looks like it doesn't even belong. And why is it there? And it's because it's a home of somebody who was, of a family whose home was destroyed and they were exiled at, at one point during the Renaissance. Uh, so Dante tries to raise support and uh, and an army, but that didn't work out. He writes a book in support of the emperor, and uh, the emperor is actually on his way to Italy with an army, uh, but unfortunately the emperor died all along the way, and Dante then after this bounces around among supporters and settles in uh, Ravenna. So, out of this, Dante starts writing, and he writes a, uh, a piece of literature. It's a three-volume piece of literature, uh, Hell, Purgatory, and uh, Paradise, or Heaven, and uh, it's called The Divine Comedy. Um, the idea of a comedy is not what we think of it today as something that's funny. Classically, a comedy was a poem with a good ending, generally directed by Providence, um, and, um, and it's usually written in the, the native language rather than being written in Latin. Uh, Dante's work is autobiographical. He writes of emerging from uh, being lost in a dark forest. If you think about that, you know, he's, he's lost everything. He um, uh, can't go back to his family, can't go home, um, and uh, he's been, um, been exiled. And so you can see why uh, he would feel this. And he talks about that right off if you read the first chapter of Inferno, which you, I would encourage you to do. Um, the second thing is that it's called an allegory of the soul's journey towards God. It's essentially an allegory of faith. Uh, you think about the first one is a recognition of sin and uh, confession and repentance. What, what we think about um, when uh, at the beginning of the gospel. And, um, and so um, he travels through hell. Um, and it, um, for that purpose. Uh, then uh, the second part, you think of that, we might think of that in terms of sanctification or purging of sin, becoming more like Christ, if we're not Catholic. If you're Catholic, you probably have a better understanding of what he means by purgatory. But it's a time of purging of sin and preparation for heaven. 
And then uh, the third stage, the third book is a state of grace or when he is in heaven. We'll talk more about um, this uh, in coming installments. It's also a political and social commentary. As um, Dante travels through uh, hell and purgatory, um, he um, encounters political, religious, literary figures, authors, classical authors, and, um, and by virtue, makes basically commentary on them by virtue of where they are, whether they're in hell, what sort of punishment they're receiving, what the nature of their sin that condemned them was. And, um, and, and so you get a lot of, uh, a, a lot of that commentary through there. Of course, it's very difficult for us to understand because these are, um, for the most part, figures that are, would be contemporary to um, Dante and people who we would have no idea who they were if we didn't study the, the history. Okay, so that's our intro to Dante. Um, we'll visit uh, Inferno in the next installment.